Oh boy, here we go. This is the Super New Year Kart 15 and 1, created by the Hummer team, and it's one of those unlicensed multi carts with multiple games that obscure groups of people make for consoles such as the NES and sell without the approval of Nintendo. And why is it called Super New Year Kart? Well, I have no idea. I guess it could have been released in early January, or around February 9th if they were following the Chinese New Year. Either way, the Bootleg Games wiki says 2005, though, and it was a great help for making this video, so I'll link it in the description. It's an interesting read. The physical cartridges have cover art with various characters featured on it, including the Rugrats, for some reason. Do they even appear anywhere in any of these games? I doubt it. I think they just combined a bunch of random shit in Photoshop and printed it out. As the title of the cart says, there's 15 games, but I'm not sure how to get to the second menu. The select button toggles between Chinese and English text, but A, B, and the start button all start the game that you currently have selected. The D-pad doesn't seem to scroll you anywhere beyond these initial eight games either. I tried everything I could think of, including various combinations of holding down one direction of the D-pad while hitting all the other buttons, but nothing seemed to work. I had heard something about DIP switches like on the Nintendo World Championship cartridges where flipping them into different combinations would give you different menus or types of games, but I don't see them in this image. It might be that big black thing, which I assume is what this bootleg games wiki is referring to, but if it's a physical button, how do you press it? Well, it took me forever to figure out, but that DIP switch wasn't really a physical switch or button or anything. It was just an extra component that forced the cartridge to start on the same menu by default and just cycle through different screens because it could somehow detect the difference between a cold boot and a system reboot. In other words, to access the other menus, you have to know to hit the reset button on your console. Or in my case, an emulator. But that reset trick wasn't working with my version of NES Topia, so I had to keep downloading other NES emulators and trying them out until I found one where it works. So I'll be playing on an emulator called FCEUX version 2.2.3. Why the fuck should anyone need to do this? Shouldn't it just show all 15 games by default? What's the point of the other menus? And then there's the 15 games themselves. But guess what? There aren't really 15 games, oh no. Some of these menu items are just redundant and outright lies, honestly. So I'll walk you through this. We have 15 items here, and the first five are all unique, right? Well, Heroin is just the second level of Hacker, so we don't have to count that as a separate game. The Duck and the Egg are pretty much the same thing, aside from one slight gameplay mechanic difference in the latter, but fuck it, let's just scratch another one off our list. Then Beachhead, Jungle War, and Adventure are just levels 2, 3, and 4 of Pink Jelly, so there's another three we can cross off the list. And then it's the same deal again, where the last three menu items are the second, third, and fourth levels of Gorge. So in total, there's, uh, six, actually, because I should have crossed Gorge out, because Gorge is the same fucking thing as Pink Jelly, just with different playable characters. So this 15-in-1 multi-card only has six games on it. <sighs> you know that classic multi cart that packaged both Super Mario Bros. and Duck Hunt together into the same cartridge? Imagine if Nintendo had marketed that as a 35-in-1 since there's three game modes in Duck Hunt and 32 levels of Super Mario Bros. So this is basically the only menu you would need after I've cut out all the games I crossed out. But after resetting the emulator a few more times, I found out that one of the menu configurations already had what I boiled it down to, except it features the egg instead of the duck. Why would anyone design something like this? And now that I know all about this needless redundancy and found this menu of six items that does away with all the pointless options, I ask yet again, what's the point of the other menus? Even Action 52, which is a far worse multi-cart in pretty much every conceivable way, didn't do this shit. Sure, some of their games were quite similar to each other, and they were redundant in that sense, but they were all still technically unique titles. And they filled up 52 slots. This piece of shit New Year cart couldn't even fill up 15. Also, in Action 52, you could return to the main menu and play something else if you were getting tired of whatever shitty game you were already playing. But this Super New Year cart... 
I don't think there's any way to do that. So you have to reset the whole console and the whole game again. And then because you did that, you have to reset it a few more times to get back to whatever menu you want to return to. Again. I mean, for fuck's sake. This thing came out more than a decade after the very well-known disaster that is Action 52. How did they make the menus even worse? I mean, my god, I've been ranting about the menus and other shit for, what, five minutes? And I haven't even played any of the games yet. Well, starting with game number one, we have The Legends. Apparently this is an update to another hack that the Hummer team made all the way back in 1993 called Street Fighter IV, some 15 years before Capcom released the official Street Fighter IV in Japanese arcades in 2008. What was the point of renaming it to The Legend when they could have kept using the name Street Fighter IV? The latter would have caught the average person's attention much more quickly in 2005 when this updated version of the game was packaged with the multi-cart. And why even originally call this Street Fighter 4 all the way back in 1993 when Street Fighter 3 hadn't even come out yet? <laughs> they must have really been trying to future-proof this shit. Oh, whatever. I don't usually play fighting games like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, or even Super Smash Bros., so I'm not entirely sure what my strategy is going to be other than to mash buttons randomly and hope I win by accident. Well, guess what? I played as this bunny girl and... Uh... What? Her name is actually Bunny? And this guy's name is Cliff? Well, that's weird as shit. But like I said, I'm not familiar with fighting games like this, so I looked up a list of official Street Fighter characters, and there's a dude named... Guy. Oh, that's the Japanese pronunciation. Well, okay. But what's this game's excuse? I mean, it sort of fits since she's dressed in that costume, but come on. Anyways, I kicked this guy's ass without too much trouble, although this fighting stage looks like we all shrunk and were in someone's sink while they're washing heads of broccoli. Just saying. Then I easily kicked this guy's ass a second time, and I guess it's best two out of three because there wasn't any sort of a third tiebreaker match. So I explored the options and bumped up the difficulty to hard, it's interesting, by the way, they have one of those sound test things. I'm not someone who's knowledgeable about your average NES game or anything, but I'm pretty sure that's not a common thing you see in NES titles, pirate hacks or otherwise. But okay, I turned the difficulty up, and now this guy's absolutely beating the shit out of me. Look at this, he finished off the last 40% of my health in 4 or 5 seconds. You know, at an earlier point in time when I wasn't recording, I'd still kick this guy's ass as the bunny girl on hard mode. But, I don't know, maybe I got lucky that time. I'm also not sure how the game determines who your opponent will be, because when I pick Cliff as a playable character, I usually get paired against the bunny girl, but... Not this time. Oh look, I'm getting my ass kicked again while two dudes cosplaying as Krillin laugh at me. Yeah, I don't know what I expected. I'm changing it to easy now, just because... Oh, I don't know, I'm not even enjoying myself all that much. Why the fuck didn't I record this game the first time I played it? I had such a different experience then. Oh look, now I get paired with the bunny girl. Well, I've taken some hits, but at least I'm sort of winning. And this is all using the same strategy of mashing the A and B button repeatedly. Oh yeah, I guess I should talk about how the controls work as well. First of all, the NES controller only has so many buttons you can use, which means this probably wasn't the best console to attempt a Street Fighter ripoff on. The D-pad does what you would expect. You can move from side to side, duck, and jump. The start button pauses, which is all fine and good, but I shit you not, the select button also makes you jump. I doubt that's normal in these kinds of games, but whatever, you can already jump with the D-pad like you're supposed to, so I guess that's not hurting anything. A punches and B kicks, and that's pretty much all there is to the controls. Other than some kind of spinning kick that all the characters seem to be able to do rather than their own unique special attack, I don't see anything else you can do in this game, such as combo moves or anything cool, and I tried hitting A and B while holding down all four buttons on the D-pad. Nothing interesting ever happened, so I never figured out how to do the spinning kick myself. I'm not sure there's even a way to block attacks. Wait. Why is this guy named Pasta? You know what would be funny? If they intended this character to be of Italian descent and they thought that was an Italian name. Well, alright. Moving on, then. The second game is The Hummer, and you would never guess what this is. A racing game and a gas-guzzling SUV? Nah, it's just a rip-off of Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, 
You know, with a tail like that, he could almost substitute his tails instead. When you start the game, you're placed immediately in front of a barrier. Yeah, it's trivial to jump over it, but in a real Sonic game, you could go on ahead with a running start, which I think is nice. That might seem like a petty complaint, but that really stuck out to me as an example of haphazardly mindless level design. So anyways, this ass is obviously filling in as Sonic himself. He runs like Sonic, rolls around the ground like Sonic, even jumps the same way. And both the A and B buttons make him jump. You could jump using more than one button in the original Sonic game with the Sega Genesis controller, but having both A and B jump in an NES title seems really weird to me. I guess it's better than having B do nothing, though. He'll do that spinning move, too, where he rolls across the ground. Apparently it's not strong enough to break one of these containers, whatever they're called. Also, neither button lets the ass jump from that position while still spinning, which is really fucking annoying. I'm not sure which Sonic game it's ripping off. The spin dash didn't appear until Sonic 2. Speaking of which, isn't it amazing to see a ripoff of a 16-bit Sega Genesis game on an 8-bit Nintendo Entertainment System? Who thinks this is a good idea? Unless you're just technically experimenting to see how much of a 16-bit game experience you can recreate on an 8-bit platform just for the hell of it, why not put it on Super Nintendo instead? I guess it was easier to bypass the lockout chip that prevents unauthorized games on the NES instead of its successor. Eh, that would need more research. Well, then I looked around at the wiki, and... It also says this game is a hack of Sonic & Knuckles 5? What the fuck is Sonic & Knuckles 5? Well, it's a hack of the famous, popular, and well-loved Sonic title, Sonic 3D Blast 5. Duh. Oh, by the way, this doesn't have Knuckles anywhere in the game other than the title screen, but from what I understand, said title screen is really the only difference between Sonic & Knuckles 5 and Sonic 3D Blast 5. Either way, both games are just the Hummer, but with a Sonic sprite and title screen. Why borrow the Sonic 3D Blast name when it's still a 2D side-scroller? Since you're at least playing a Sonic this time instead of the dumbass, it's at least slightly better, but then... Where did Sonic 3D Blast 5 come from? It's a direct ripoff of a Sonic game off the Sega Genesis, right? No, of course not! It's a derivative work from yet another hack called Samari. I'm not kidding. We live in a world, a universe, a historical timeline where this shit exists. And the name Samari is a combination of Sonic and Mario. <laughs> Get it? The first level actually looks more like the classic Green Hill Zone this time with a better selection of colors, and... Mario's walk cycle animation is decent enough, but then there's this stupid fucking pit that's too deep for you to jump out of, so you'll either lose your rings or run a timer out, so you might as well restart the whole game since you got stuck so early in the level. And then finally, Samari was ripped off of the original Sonic the Hedgehog game that made its debut on the Genesis console in 1991. So let's recap. Sonic the Hedgehog comes out in 1991 on Sega Genesis, then Samari comes out in 1994 for the Famicom, or the Japanese NES if you prefer. Then Sonic 3D Blast 5. Then Sonic & Knuckles 5. And then finally, in the far-off future of 2005, the Hummer. Oh, and by the way, Samari was also created by the Hummer team, the same guys that created the whole Super New Year Kart 15 and 1. So that means all these intermediate titles were also made by them. So they just... What? Fuck it, I'm just rambling again, and I can make a whole video on that shit, honestly. But getting back to the actual game on this multi-cart... Couldn't they have used more colors to make the background a little more appealing to look at? There's like, three shades of orange, three shades of green, some gray and white, and... I don't know, this just doesn't look very good. I know there are fewer colors available on an 8-bit console, but Super Mario Bros. 3 is fine. See how colorful everything looks? Hell, even Samari looked okay for what it is, and again, that was made by the same team of hackers that made the Hummer. So what happened here? And the layout of these backgrounds makes no sense. There's random floor and pillar tiles all over the inside of the walls. It's like they put zero thought into what tiles should go where. Speaking of walls, you know how when you jump up along a wall you're attempting to get over, you might be subconsciously pushing the D-pad to the right so you can instantly keep moving when you breach said wall? Yeah, don't do that here. It took me a few attempts before I realized that some of these random tile layouts on this cliff have some kind of thing going on where you collide with it and lose all your upward momentum. Then for a few seconds, I thought this was a wall, but no, it's just part of the background. You're supposed to go through there. 
And green and orange colors keep wrapping around the screen and bleeding through the cloudy sky on the left, so I was like, there was a platform up here? But no, I'm just dumb. At least I got a nice combo kill there. But yeah, just bounce up and don't hit the D-pad again until your feet clear the ledge. Early on in the level, you get to a couple of jumping springs, or whatever the hell they are. They bounce you up to a ceiling that's sloped, and you're like, Wow, we're gonna do that thing where Sonic rolls all over the place? But no, that curved ramp is just part of the background. Of course it is. Also, you can stick yourself inside the ceiling. You can stay up there as long as you want, as long as you keep running to the left. Unfortunately, you can't jump anywhere from here and get yourself on top of the ceiling like Mario can in World 1-2. How the hell do you even kill this thing? The spin dash doesn't work, regardless of whether you tackle the front or back of this mechanical lobster, or whatever it is. And jumping on it hurts you because of those spikes on its back, so... Yeah, I'd say just ignore it. But then I fall into a pit where you can use horizontal spring platform thingies to boost your way out, but I cannot for the life of me get this to work 90% of the time. It eventually works, but fuck. It works. I swear, it actually does work. Get up there, you dumbass! Finally! Oh, fuck. And immediately I got hit. And during this tunnel I was confused for a few seconds because they didn't use consistent collision detection with the tiles on the ceiling. These orange floors and walls are fine, but the ceiling here starts with the green tiles. Did they decide that having a space that narrow to fit through was too difficult, so they just removed collision detection there instead of visually altering the tile set as well? When you pause, the music still plays while you and the enemy sprites disappear without the word pause showing up on the screen. What if you hit the start button and pause the game by accident? You might think the game somehow crashed. Is displaying the word paused really too much to ask? I tried as hard as I could to progress through this game somewhat, but I genuinely could not beat this first level. Granted, I didn't attempt this anymore after I ran out of lives, so it's not like I spent several minutes trying to persevere for a while. Oh, and speaking of lives, the Hummer icon turns into Sonic when you get a game over. And also I noticed something else midway through playing. The lives counter goes down the instant you disappear from the screen rather than during the transition when the screen fades to black, and then back from black when it resets your position in the level. Why would I even comment on this? Well, it's because there were a couple of times I died, and then I looked at how many lives I had remaining and I thought there was a glitch where the lives counter had stopped incrementing downwards. I suppose it's my fault for not keeping track of how many lives I had anyways, but damn. You know why this game is so hard? It's because no matter how many rings you have, you only drop three when you get hit. Now I get it, there's a limit to how many sprites the NES hardware can render on the screen all at once, but the least they could have done is not have the rings go through the walls half the time where you can't reach them. So you get hit, and you have a decent chance of not recovering any of the rings, making further progression through the level nearly impossible. Again, I'm not blaming the Hummer team for the hardware specs of an 8-bit console, but this is still a bad flaw that makes recreating Sonic the Hedgehog on NES a pointless endeavor. Unless... maybe you redesign it so that a hit only takes away 10 or 20 rings or something, but whatever. I'm not really interested in exploring this game any further anyways, and we might be here all day if I do. Actually, why doesn't this multi-cart let you access all the levels of the Hummer from the main menu screen like it does for other games? If it did, then I probably would have taken a quick glance at what else they did here, and they could have called it 33 and 1 or something. Oh well, on to game number 3, Pink Jelly. Uh, wow. Where to begin? First of all, there's no title screen for Pink Jelly. I guess this isn't as special as the first two games. Secondly, the control sucks! You walk at a slow pace, but when you jump, you lurch forward all of a sudden. It feels horrible. You can jump straight up if you're standing still, but there's no way that I know of to control how far forward you can jump. Either you jump straight up, or you jump forward by a certain predefined distance, and there's nothing you can do about it. And you bounce up after jumping on an enemy, so you might hit the bird by accident. I don't know how to kill this bird anyways, but it doesn't seem to fly low enough to be able to hit you unless you jump into it. I'd say the best strategy is to just avoid it. At least they're generous with the number of lives they give you. Third, the music that plays when this level loads is... strange, yet somehow fitting. 
Like, the game knows it's dropped you into a weird world with weird characters that you have to explore. And this cat looks so carefree and happy, but where is he? Is he supposed to be inside a cave or something? Might be a girl cat, actually, I don't know. It is pink, after all. But the point is, these colors make it look like he's walking through mountains or stalagmites of literal shit. But the lower part of the background looks more like boulders and... red autumn leaves? I have no idea where I am. Fourth, when you pause the game, the sprites still disappear, but the word pause at least shows up. But did they really find it necessary to have some kind of shadow drop for those letters? Damn, it looks like there's multiple extra eyes in there. Actually, I guess it's more of a neon drop rather than a shadow. The oh, fuck it, who cares? At least the music shuts the hell up like it's supposed to. And fifth, do you know what this game can't do? It can't scroll the screen. Watch what happens when I make it to the right. Did I beat level one? It faded to black and played something that sounded like maybe a victory tune. I don't know. And it does this every time, too. The weird jumping control feels even worse when trying to cross this dead tree that's possessed. It's not too difficult to get over, but man, this control is such shit. After the third screen where you kill... What the fuck is that supposed to be? And sometimes if I'm really not paying attention to what I'm doing, I get killed more than once because you respawn in a specific area where the enemy might still be located. Anyways, after the third screen, you suddenly appear in a beach or something. I'm sure the salty ocean spray smells a lot better than the inside of someone's large intestines. That was my last fucking life. Apparently now the bird can suddenly swoop down low enough to kill you even if you don't jump. And after all that complaining, once I recovered from the shock of picking apart the first screen of the game among other things, it dawned on me that you can get through each of these screens in about five seconds. And I'm not being dramatic or boasting about some kind of speedrunning skill that I have. That's actually something you can do most of the time. Maybe not during your first attempt at the game when you're getting used to the shitty controls. Then you'll get through the levels at a snail's pace of about... Mm, maybe eight seconds or so. But let's say that you're used to the controls. You reset the game and start from the beginning, and it takes you five seconds on average to get through each level. There's 12 levels, so you think you can beat the game in a minute or less? Well, guess what? That's impossible. Look at these stupid transition screens where you repeatedly listen to the same bullshit victory tune each time you finish a level and you're rewarded with a black background. You know how long that lasts? About a comparatively measly four seconds. So it's actually quite easy to beat this game in under two minutes, but half the time you'd just be sitting there waiting for the next level to load. I've heard of short games before, but I've never heard of anything like this where you spend maybe 40 to 50% of the length of the game waiting for it to load the next screen. That's just horrific, even if it is only a little less than a minute of actual time. This particular run-through that you're watching right now took me about a minute and 43 seconds to complete, and that's despite me getting killed three times. And what do I have to show for it? Not a goddamn thing, because what happens when you beat the game? You go back to the first level. Sure, your score and the number of lives you have left carries over, the enemy placement is randomized a bit, but I still beat the game already, so what's the point? Who thought any of this was actually a good idea? It took me longer to complain about this game than it took me to actually beat it. No wonder this game didn't get its own title screen. It's the worst one yet. By the way, like I mentioned earlier when I was looking over the main menu, Pink, Jelly, and Gorge are the same game other than the latter having different characters. Gorge gives you a character select screen, which looks more like glitched sprites rather than playable characters. Yeah, here's a tip, guys. You don't have to use the upper half of the in-game sprite to show off your character here, so you can be a bit more artistic if you want. Actually, I could have used another one of their own games as an example. But anyways, there's supposed to be four different people from the Lord of the Rings. Well, that's because Gorge also goes by another name called Rings, yeah, real clever, that was a hack of something called Panda Adventure, which was, you guessed it, made by the Hummer team themselves. Well, I don't have a ROM of Panda Adventure, but it looks like it was an original game, at least. And how does Pink Jelly fit into all this? Well, it's simply yet another hack of Gorge slash Rings. So while this family tree isn't as long and complicated as the Sonic the Hedgehog ripoffs we discussed previously, it's uniquely weird in that one hack is on the same multi-card as another hack that it was derived from. Now, one last thing. 
Out of all the games on this multi-cart to make redundant menu items for to take you to different levels, why the fuck did they pick a game where you could beat all of said levels in under two minutes, and they did it twice for the same two-minute game? What the actual fuck? There had to be more than one person that put this multi-cart together. No one said, you know, maybe we should have these extra menu items take you to different levels of the Hummer since it's so much more difficult to beat. And someone else was like, Nah, bro, Pink Jelly is such shit that no one's gonna bother trying to get to the end of the first levels, so we gotta list the other levels in the menu so they'll click on them. And then we'll just list the same game a second time along with all four of its levels. Just... Why? Why would you... Why? That's just... Ugh, that's so fucking stupid. God damn it, I, I gotta move on. Holy fuck though, I'm only halfway through six games. Well, let's see. Number four is simply called War. Well, they say war is hell, and these games... Yeah, this demo sucks. The character just dies repeatedly, and then a second demo appears, and it's like... The guys are taking a shit from above. Wait, is the game two-player? I'm confused now. But alright, well, let's try it out firsthand. Ugh. Oh, well, my first big surprise is that I made an incorrect assumption when I looked at the first demo. The player actually controls this other guy. But can you blame me? When you first look at the screen layout, you think, horizontal side-scroller, and you see a guy walking to the side. The other guy seems to be trapped on the bottom of the screen and is throwing shit at the first guy, so... In some ways, this may be the worst demo ever. I literally came to an incorrect conclusion that I'd be playing as one of the computer-controlled characters. And by the way, the first demo doesn't even show off the first level. The second demo does, though. So if that wasn't intentional for some reason, then they got that backwards. By the way, it takes three seconds, and I'm being quite literal when I say three seconds, for the game to take you from the title screen to the demo if you don't press start soon enough. So here we are. Okay, going back to my own gameplay footage. Both A and B throw different weapons, and each reaches a different height, so you go back and forth between those two buttons to attack the guys on those two platforms. I don't think there's a way to vertically move up the screen to the upper levels, but I guess you're not supposed to, since up on the D-pad doesn't do anything. Down picks up upgrades, though, but I don't know what they all are. Some are invincibility, and the ones with a face on them are extra lives. Some of them are letter Bs, and even though that's special enough to have its own counter at the top of the screen underneath all the lives you have, I have no idea what they do. You know, these games are so shitty that I'm learning all kinds of subtle things about game design that you shouldn't do. For instance, when you pick up an invincibility power-up, a different short song plays for a few seconds while you're invincible. There's nothing inherently wrong with this, of course. It occurs from time to time in most Mario games. But in Mario, getting an invincibility power-up doesn't happen that often. In War, however, you can potentially get one of these power-ups every several seconds, so the game is constantly interrupting the main game music quite frequently in order to play something else. Then, like I said earlier, the second level is actually the first demo screen the game showed you, and it looks like we're in a different part of the Pink Jelly Cave. This level is stupid, because after a few seconds, you'll realize that even though the enemy respawns immediately, he doesn't do anything differently to try and evade your attacks, and always spawns at the same place on the screen. So you can move all the way to the left and spam attacks up at him and just kill him over and over again. Seems cool at first until you realize that this takes fucking forever anyways, and it gets boring pretty quickly. And I'm cheating by using a turbo button to spam my attacks. It would be even worse if you had to actually tap the button repeatedly to keep throwing your projectiles. There's some kind of weird enemy off to the right, eyeballs that shoot bullets at you. Maybe it's a sniper, but the bullets move kind of slowly and they'll never reach you all the way on the left side of the screen, so who cares? And while you're repeatedly killing the same guy over and over again, he'll drop upgrades pretty often. Seriously, you can grind here for a minute or two and stock up on lives pretty quickly. Then it dawned on me, after doing this for a few minutes and getting absolutely nowhere, that I'm supposed to take out the sniper with those bombs. Now I realize what that B is for, by the way. You have unlimited knives, apparently, but only so many bombs. I don't know what kind of sense that makes. It's not like one weapon is more powerful than the other. One weapon kills one respawning enemy. 
and the second weapon kills the other respawning enemy, so they're both equally powerful and necessary. Right? I could understand limiting the availability of the bomb if it killed multiple enemies at once, but it doesn't. So what makes the bomb so much more valuable than the knives if each weapon does their job against their own intended enemy with equal effectiveness? And for God's sake, I keep hearing that stupid invincibility tune cutting in. I wasn't joking about how often that happens. So now I figured out how to progress through the level. Although I don't know when the level progresses. Seems like the game just does it whenever it wants. Now I'm on level 3, and all of a sudden the game is much harder because the sniper is shooting in two directions at once. Where the fuck am I all of a sudden anyways? I feel like I got teleported into some urban warfare in the middle of Baghdad. I never thought I'd say this, but I want to go back to the shit cave Pink Jelly was exploring. There's so many bullets flying around, and I swear to god, I'm getting hit so often that grinding for extra lives and bombs in the previous level ended up not mattering at all. I died here, and honestly, I don't care what the rest of the game is like. I've seen enough of it. By the way, that game over screen looks like Frogger after he got crushed by a car trying to cross a busy street. Number five, Hacker. This is apparently a slightly modified version of Titanic, another classic from the Hummer team. Although the version on this multicart gets rid of the actually decent looking title screen. For whatever reason, most of the enemies you fight in this game are all the innocent passengers on the ship. So either they die from drowning in the freezing water, or from blunt trauma from your fists. How am I the good guy in this situation? I mean, sure, they're programmed to attack you, if they could walk up the fucking stairs! And you could argue self-defense, but... Why? This doesn't make any sense at all. What were these hackers thinking? Okay, I finally killed this guy. That grandfather clock's pendulum that swings back and forth. Could they have possibly made that look any more phallic? It even looks like it bends a bit as it's swinging, as if it were not fully erect. All it's missing is some color. Even when I pause the game, it keeps swinging around. And how the fuck was I supposed to know that chandelier would fall on me? Okay, here's more bullshit for you. You see how this guy is holding his gun in front of him? The tip of that gun is apparently the front edge of the sprite's collision detection box, so I can hurt this guy by punching the air in front of his face. And speaking of the Hummer team and not making any sense, apparently another modified hack was spawned from this shit, which was technically made by Hummer Technology, which was a successor of the Hummer team, but who even cares at this point? It's pretty much the same people as far as I'm concerned. Anyways, somebody looked at this and thought, you know what we could turn this into? An adaptation of the first Harry Potter book, of course. Why? Why would you do that? I mean, look at this shit. Scrawny little Harry is kicking Dudley with enough force to send him flying back a few feet. And even more unrealistic than that is the fact that we're in Aunt Petunia's house and there's rats crawling all over the place and bats hanging from the ceiling. I draw the line here. Partly because I've about had it with this shit, and partly because I could make an entire separate video on Harry's legend. So you know what? I will. But that's for another day. In the meantime, I'll glance at Heroin real quick. Heroin is just as tedious as Hacker. Only difference is you play as Rose. Even though she can still attack while crouching, she only punches whatever is in front of her face, rather than kicking at the ground like Hacker can. That might work for regular enemies. You know, those innocent passengers who are roughly your own height. But not with rats scurrying about. I can barely even stand on the floor because the rat's horizontal walking space is so small. Oh, I'm sorry, I was mistaken. She can actually kick. The air in front of her face. Seriously, I tried over and over again to kick this rat. Not even during the course of normal gameplay, but just as an experiment to see if it was even possible at all. And I could not kick this fucking rat in the face. And there's two rats here at different elevations. I keep trying to attack while jumping to get rid of the rat on top, but it doesn't work. And I keep banging my heads on the pipes above while I'm attempting to jump around, too. Wait, the screen won't scroll any further. You're telling me this is a dead end? Oh sure, there was a 1-up that I collected, but come on! Apparently I didn't have to go through this room after all. And the 1-up didn't do me any good either, because I'm fucking done with this game. Stupid door leading me off to a pointless side room. Bunch of 
fucking horse shit, honestly. Well, wait a minute. Don't I have a bit of health left, or what? Alright, last, and maybe least, who knows at this point, the duck. Nice pseudo 3D effect with the ground, though. They kind of successfully pulled that off in their Samari hack with the sides of the cliffs. Okay, so it's a duck hunt ripoff. I probably should have guessed that. The D-pad controls the cursor as opposed to an actual light gun, which you might be able to emulate with a mouse on a PC. But guess what? You don't seem to have any limits on ammo or reload time. So if you have a turbo controller, or an extra button that you can map as a turbo button, you can effectively shoot these ducks with a machine gun. Too easy. They didn't think that one through at all. Even if I don't use the turbo button or the D-pad, the ducks are big enough targets and just bounce around the screen like the logo on a DVD player's screensaver that they'll eventually fly in front of my cursor anyways. And the hit detection is quite forgiving. Sometimes I kill a duck even though I would have otherwise thought that the bullet might have just barely missed it. There's no way to pause this game, although given everything I've said up to this point, there's probably no reason to pause it anyways. There also doesn't seem to be a time limit that I'm aware of, so... I'm not sure there's a way to actually lose this game. Seriously, I left this emulator running one time for maybe ten minutes while I went to make myself some lunch, and the ducks were still just flying around, and my score never went down either, so it's not like I missed something happening while I wasn't looking. Other than the number of points you need in order to progress, I'm not sure there's any difference between any of the stages. In fact, they could probably have as many stages as they wanted, since it's just the same shit repeating itself, and you only have to design it once before programming it to loop with just the stage number incrementing upwards. What's really amazing is that if you could find some kind of object with enough weight that would hold down a turbo button for you, the game could literally beat itself since the ducks will eventually fly in front of the crosshairs. Although there are some places where the ducks fly more often than others, but... I would pick that large black area on the right of the tilted tree, roughly on the dividing line between the left third and the middle third of the screen. That's assuming you still want to sit here and play with a D-pad, though, since it always resets your cursor to the middle of the screen every time a new level starts. Alright, well we'll take a look at the egg real quick. The only difference is that these ducks drop eggs, which penalizes you by subtracting 50 points from your total score when they hit the ground. This means that it's finally possible to lose at this game. You just have to sit there and do nothing and let the ducks drop their eggs. If one of them hits the ground while your score is zero, you get a game over. Turns out that your level progression is based on your score rather than how many ducks you shoot. So if you always let two eggs hit the ground for each duck you kill, you'll never get anywhere. You can't shoot the eggs either. I tried. Still, this game is stupidly easy. It just takes slightly more time and effort to beat a level if you're not cheating with a turbo button. Because if you do opt for the turbo button, you'll be able to shoot all the ducks before they even have a chance to drop an egg. You know what? I should go back to the duck, set up a timer, and see how long it takes to play through this while holding down the turbo button. I'll speed up the footage, of course. Ah! 
he wants to marry me, and he may a honey be. Every minute he gets bolder, no he's leaning on my shoulder. Ah! He's kissing me, oh my, he is making eyes of me. Ah! He is a finesse to me, oh my, he is almost breaking my heart. I am mistaken, mercy let his function date him. Ah! He wants to marry me, and be may a honey be. He is fetish just like jelly. When he left, he shakes his shoulder. Ah! He is kissing me. Ah! Well, after beating 15 stages and accumulating over 400,000 points over the course of about 48 minutes, there's no end in sight. And what do I have to show for it? Not a goddamn thing. Bunch of horseshit. Well, that's pretty much all there is to show you. Effectively just six games rather than the promised 15. If I had to rank these games from best to worst, I'd say the number one thing they had to offer was The Legend. Sure, it's not a good substitute for a real fighting game, but it has relatively decent visuals and audio, at least by Hummer Team standards. And the control isn't that bad, so it's whatever. The second best game is probably Hacker. Once again, the graphics and sounds are okay, but come on, really the only thing saving this from being ranked any lower is the fact that every other game on this multi-cart just sucks so much harder. It's a below-average side-scroller with awkward controls, that's about it. I still might recommend this game, though, but only as a frustrating challenge if you're into that kind of thing, not because it's decent in any other way. The game I would rate third highest is the Hummer. Now I know, I endlessly complained about this one, and there's really no redeeming qualities about this game, but the fact that it's such an ambitious idea, recreating a 16-bit game on an 8-bit console, I guess in my opinion that sheer ambitiousness alone allows it to edge out ahead of other games. Number four is War. I actually struggled with whether or not I should rank War behind the Hummer, because you might argue that how ambitious the latter game was is ultimately irrelevant if the resulting gameplay is still shit. I think in some ways War is easier to pick up and play than the Hummer, but... War is just... I don't know what it is, but it just seems so unmemorable compared to everything else. The gameplay was so simple that it should have just been its own mini-game for something else rather than its own standalone title. And the fact that the first time I ever looked at this game, and the demo confused me about which sprite was controlled by the computer, and which one I was going to be playing as? No. Fuck you. War gets ranked to number four. And then we get to number five, and I actually spent even more time debating with myself which game would be ranked fifth, and, therefore, which other game would be ranked the worst of the worst. They're both so terrible. The choices regarding each game's design so absurd, and yet, somehow both are very easy to play, but they're also completely different games, so they're difficult to compare. But after a lot of thought, I decided that number five is... the duck, or the egg if you prefer. Why is it not quite the worst of the worst? Maybe it's because it vaguely reminds me of a game that's actually a decent classic. Or maybe it's because, for all of its faults, frustration isn't really a part of the gameplay experience. The duck sprites are nice. I'm not even being sarcastic, they actually look good. But if that's all the good stuff you can say about this game, then oh man. And then finally, well, by process of elimination, you already know what's last. It's Pink Jelly. How do I even do a final summary of this one? I'm not even sure there's any good redeeming quality about it whatsoever. I'll just repeat one thing I already said about it. It took me longer to complain about all of the problems with this game than it actually took me to beat said game. I mean... <laughs> I can't eat. Oh god, I need to stop. Fuck, what a dumb collection of games. Sure, it's not nearly as bad as the Action 52 multi-cart. And yeah, you can find a few examples of graphics and sounds that are okay. But so many of the design choices in all of these titles really make you scratch your head and wonder. 
What kind of thought process was employed in creating all this? And I don't claim to be an expert in video game design. It's usually always much easier to critique something than to make it yourself. But this is still one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen in my life. The games themselves may not be as bad as what Action 52 would offer, but in some ways, given the overall backstory of ripoffs and how these games are packaged and presented to you, it's an even more freakish multi-cart.